Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're gonna go down the rabbit hole. We're doing it. We're going for you, Donald Trump. It's been a very long time. Tom Ritchie, my good friend, my southern brother from another mother, made a really great video on Hitler and Trump and the comparisons, and I thought that I would kind of do a response video, but really I'm just gonna ramble about Donald Trump. But we're definitely gonna talk about some racial issues, some nativistic issues, some fascist issues, and see if we can't walk the line on all of those. I will say this, uh, Mr. Ritchie ended his video by saying making these direct comparisons between Donald Trump and Adolf Hitler or him being a real fascist might not be the best for political discourse, but since it's out there, we're going there, baby. So giddy up for the learning, guys. Let's see if we can talk about Donald Trump and not have our heads in the So Tom made a really great video kind of in this comparison between Hitler and Trump, uh, which is called Godwin's Law. Everything on the internet eventually ends up bringing in Hitler. But some have argued that, you know, while that usually goes away, the more we talk about it, the more connections that we might find. But his first point is spot on. Hitler killed millions. Trump ticked off millions. And that's like 99% of being Adolf Hitler. So if anything, and we're making any comparisons, you know, we're working within that 1% and not the 99%. So I think that's really important to point out. But I do take issue with some of the knockdowns on the comparison where I think there's a little bit more there. Uh, Tom kind of knocks down this idea that Trump is playing really racial politics that he sees things in racial terms, if anything, he's a nativist. I mean, he talks about the history of nativism, which is true. We've always had kind of these groups pop up, which are the anti-Irish, anti-Italian, anti-whatever. And I think that kind of the point, at least when we teach this in the history books, is, no, that was so wrong. So I think that kind of making that comparison and Trump doing it today with Muslims or with the other or you know, Latin American immigrants or whatever it is, that, oh, that's wrong today. But beyond that, Trump has kind of said things, and there's some things in his history that are a little bit disturbing when it comes to race. Language, I would point that out. When you hear Mr. Trump talk about ethnicities, he doesn't talk about individuals. He doesn't say, well, there was an African American. He says, I have a great relationship with the blacks. I have, I've always had a great relationship with the blacks. The blacks the Muslims, the Jews. And I think that that's kind of a disturbing peek into his mindset on kind of his paradigm of how he sees people in general. He sees them in groups maybe before he sees them in individuals. And he's talked about genetics in kind of a disturbing way. He gave an interview once, and I'll throw it up on the wall really quick, where he talks about his own DNA. So you can watch that right now. You know, I have a certain gene. I'm a gene believer. Hey, when you connect two racehorses, you usually end up with a fast horse. And I really was, you know, I had a, a good gene pool. So if he's a good racehorse, who's a bad racehorse? That's what I want to know. So I think that that's disturbing. His father, and you know, it's maybe not the best idea always to kind of lace somebody who their parent is, but he loves his father. He's never talked ill about his father. He got a million bucks from his father, and his father had some run-ins with race. Woody Guthrie, they recently found a song or a poem that he wrote that specifically referred to Fred Trump and how he was a racist and he had hate in his heart for blacks. And he was talking about kind of how he rented apartments in Brooklyn. And you might say, well, that's his dad. He's a segregationist. That's terrible. Well, in 1973, Donald Trump was sued by the Justice Department for doing the same thing in his Brooklyn apartments, telling African Americans and Latinos that apartments weren't available when they were available and jacking up the price to scare them away. He settled in 1975. And then in 1978, he was sued for doing it again by the Justice Department. So there's that kind of past as well. There's also his reaction to when he's asked about Klan support and racist support for his organization. And I know he said, you know, I disavow these groups, and a few times he might not have said it fast enough, and, and people say, well, what do you want the guy to do? I want the guy to really answer in a strong, powerful, eloquent way about race that shows intellect and understanding and empathy. That's what I want. So I think that he hasn't really provided that. And there's been some issues. You know, he's retweeted racists. There is also this PBS uh, interview with one of his volunteers. And I think that if I had a volunteer working with me, that I might want someone in that volunteer headquarters looking at their tattoos. So when you have a racist manning the phones with the 88 on their wrist, which is H.H. Heil Hitler. That might not be a great idea when you're being accused of being a racist. So 
you know, I'm not gonna say that he's a racist, but I think that that's fruit that can be bitten on. I think that's an apple that we can play with. That makes no sense. I think it's fair game, and we can have this conversation, and I think that the media really has an obligation to ask these hard questions. Tom also points out that, you know, Hitler ran as a moderate and that Trump is running as an extremist. But what I would point out is that we all understand, I know Tom understands this, that that's the primary, that he's appealing to a very kind of subset group of voters. I think that we all know, and we are all winking and nodding, that when it comes to the general, he's gonna pivot like a basketball superstar, and he's gonna start backtracking his positions. The last thing that I would point out is we have to remember that Donald Trump was one of the biggest birthers in this country when it came to seeing this president as not one of us, that trying to constantly point out that he is, you know, an outsider, that he wasn't born here, that he's lying, it's the Manchurian candidate, he's really a Muslim, he's going to steal your bay base. So I think that that was outside of the uh, fair game field in politics, and I don't think that Mr. Trump has ever paid a political cost for that. Maybe that's just going to have to be up to the voters in the general election as he gets more scrutiny and the spotlight really grows. So we talked about race and ethnicity. Let's talk a little bit now about whether or not Donald Trump is a fascist. <laughs> So what I find most kind of ironic about Donald Trump and the Republican Party running the way that he's running is that kind of the paradigm in politics is that if you're conservative, you believe in a smaller role for the federal government. And if you are left-leaning, you believe in a larger role. And Donald Trump is running as a conservative, and he's really arguing for a very expanded imperial presidency where he's in charge. And some of the things that I think are a little bit disturbing when we talk about authoritarianism and fascism is the way that he answers questions. Questions. When he was asked about his comments relating to targeting not only terrorists, but their families and their children, and for advocating torture beyond waterboarding, he was asked what would happen if the military generals, which they have said, would disobey those orders. You know, in Geneva Conventions, international law, you're not allowed to follow an illegal order. And Donald Trump responded by basically saying, oh, they'd do it. I'd make them do it. So what would you do as commander-in-chief if the U.S. military refused to carry out those orders? They won't refuse. They're not going to refuse me. Believe me. And then he backtracked that later. But it's a quick peek into the way that he sees power and that who really controls the reins all by himself. He was asked recently um, who would be advising you on foreign matter policies, and he went on to explain how smart he is when it comes to foreign policies, and he's not worrying about that. He relies on himself and maybe down the road he'll release some names. So I think that failing really to have not only an inner circle, but an inner circle that can influence you and change your mind is kind of a, a little bit disturbing in terms of what would happen if he was the president with all of the power, at least some of the power, which I think he sees as all of the power. Also, the comments related to violence. And I know that everybody gets into their left-right game and the protester shouldn't be stopping his free speech and yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, this has never happened. <laughs> no candidate has ever said. If you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. In the good old days, they'd rip him out of that seat so fast. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. You know, you say what you mean and you mean what you say. And if you don't say what you mean and mean what you say, then you're responsible for the reaction to how people would logically interpret that comment. So I think that if this was anybody else, I think that they might be arrested for inciting violence. I mean, that's what it comes down to, especially when you have millions of people who are following your lead. Now, while there are obvious differences in the mannerisms between Hitler or say like a Mussolini and Donald Trump, um, Donald Trump might be not as a great orator, but he's a hell of a tweeter. I think it's hard to make the connections in terms of communication styles because we're living in a different media environment. And Donald Trump, whether he read Hitler or not, is certainly commanding media attention and getting people riled up through his use of 
mass media and soaking up all of the airtime and how he treats people. Maybe this is the political correctness kind of thing, but it's wrong. I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a stand. I'm not Johnny Cash right now. It's wrong to call people names. It's wrong to insult women or minorities or anybody and to be able to get away with that. And I think that it's a way of using intimidation. Now, he has a media hit list. This is true. Maybe other politicians do too, but this is pretty transparent in what has happened. Ben Sharikinger wrote an article in Politico recently where he talked about Trump's campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, and how there are past um, episodes of sexism in his past and the way that he has treated some reporters, in fact, being accused of roughing up a conservative reporter at a Trump event. Uh, his past connections with the Coach Brothers and how he left that organization. So it was a negative article. Banned? He's not allowed to come to any Trump events anymore. And just this week, he's basically told his followers that they're going to boycott Megyn Kelly because he's so upset that Megyn Kelly pointed out his sexist comments in the past at the debate. I don't want to get all John Oliver and make Donald Trump again, but there is this disturbing hand story. <laughs> you know, Mark Rubio pointed out the size of Donald Trump's hands. We all know that he made a penis reference at a debate on national TV with kids watching. But at the end of the day, he said, that's so ridiculous. Why would anybody point out my hands before? And John Oliver has pointed out this, that Mad Magazine did that for years. Um, now the uh, head of Vanity Fair, the former editor of Mad Magazine, had made fun of Donald Trump's hands and Donald Trump would send him back pictures circling his hands in gold pen and writing, you know, look at those hands. So he's had a lot of experience with people making fun of his hands. <laughs> I don't know what that says about politics and the fact that I'm talking about this on YouTube, but that is part of the national debate and the dialogue and it kind of shows us where we're going. One other comparison I'll talk about really quick is Tom basically says that you know, Hitler was a very aggressive foreign policy guy gobbling up territory. How can you make the connection with Donald Trump who wants to build a wall and kind of isolate ourselves. But I would say that there probably is a little bit more nuance to that. He's really talked in a very aggressive way about going after ISIS, about killing innocent women and children if need be. And I'm not sure if I believe anything that he says. So if we don't believe his real views on immigration, that that's up for grabs, or whether he really is pro-choice or pro-life, or whether or not he really believes in universal health care or private system, what do we believe in terms of his foreign policy? policy. What if, you know, Putin says you have tiny hands? Were you going to invade? I probably not, but I'm not so sure. So is Donald Trump Hitler? Absolutely not. 99%, that's what I said in the beginning of the video, right? If you don't believe in genocide and killing millions of people, you're 99% not like Adolf Hitler. But that other 1%, maybe it's up for grabs. We should discuss it down in the comments below. Is Donald Trump a fascist? I think that's even more of an interesting question. Leave it down in the comments below whether you think he is or if he's not. But I would say one more time that I agree that really making these direct comparisons is not not the best thing for political discourse. We should all calm down, discuss the issue like rational, intelligent human beings, and then make our wise vote. So we could talk about this forever, guys, whether he's a successful businessman or not. Maybe it's a future video. What's the future in terms of the nomination process? I have a brokered convention video if you wanna go watch that and learn about kind of the political history of brokered conventions in the United States. But please go watch Tom Ritchie's video. It's a really great video. You're gonna enjoy it. You're gonna to subscribe to him if you haven't done that already. So go giddy up and do that when you're done watching this video. Now I am coming to grips with what I said in a very early video about Donald Trump that I made, I think, back in May or June, where I said that if he won the nomination, I would cut off my pinky. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that where I, you know, really won't lose too much of the finger. So if you have any ideas, leave it down in the comments below. I was wrong with the rest of the bourgeoisie political class. We're going to have to see what happens next, kitties. If anything, if you love political science, you know, you're loving the season right now. If you haven't subscribed, check out Hip Hughes History. Please do that. I'll say it again. Giddy up for the learning. And I always say it where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you guys next time. Put your press my buttons.